everyone. Welcome back to SFC's Food for Thought series. For those of you who are just seeing SFC for the first time, we are an advocacy group made by students and young professionals for students and young professionals who believe that Canada can have a strong future in resources, the economy, and the environment. Please connect with us on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn at Students for Canada if you want to learn more about what we do. Today, we are hosting Keith Sullivan. Keith grew up in the small fishing community of Calvert on the southern shore of Newfoundland and Labrador. It was here that Keith fished with his father on an inshore fishing vessel for over two decades. During this time, it became apparent to Keith just how important adjacent resources are to coastal communities. In 2005, Keith started working as a science program coordinator at the Fish, Food and Allied Workers Union. Since then, he has been elected to president of the union. The Fish, Food and Allied, worked, Allied Worker Union represent over 15,000 working women and men through Newfoundland and Labrador. Aside from the fishing industry, the FFAW Unifor also represent workers in the hotel, hospitality, brewing, metal fabrication, banking, and oil sectors. Keith fished with his fault. Keith brings an ex extensive experience in fisheries management, research, labor negotiations, and public policy creation. In addition, Keith is also an executive member of the E-Canadian Independent Fish Harvesters Federation, an advisory board member of Marine Institute, a board member of Unifor, and he represented Canada on the world stage as a commissioner to the North Atlantic Fisheries Organization, or NAFO. Before I hand the floor over to Keith, please know that attendees are encouraged to ask questions throughout the presentation using the Q&A box, which we will address at the end of the session. For all of those watching live or watching the recording, our special word of the day, of the day is phishing. So for anyone watching, the special word is phishing. And if you DM us that on Instagram, you will get some SFC merchandise for DMing us that special word. So now with all of that out of the way, um, I will now share the spotlight with our guests, uh, Keith. Welcome, Keith. Start off. Yes, thanks. So uh, happy, happy to be here. And uh, I, I guess if we're going to start, I can uh, share a screen and, and get down to business today. Okay, I'm getting a, a thumbs up, so we'll take that as a good sign. So yeah, thank you very much for for having uh, having me today and for the lovely introduction. And yeah, so here in Newfoundland and Labrador, if you guys uh, would know, uh, how many people are on uh, on here? By the way, in the the audience, how many people are we speaking to here? Looks like about seven, eight people in the call right now. Okay, okay, good. So, so yeah, just the, the, the Newfoundland and Labrador. I mean, our economy, uh, lifestyle, a lot of the things built on the fishery, the the reason why many of us uh, are really here. So it's, uh, you know, really uh, still one of the most important uh, uh industries and, and jobs for people here. And like you said, we represent about 15,000 people. 13,000 of those would be in the fishery. Most would be independent uh, owner operator harvesters. Uh, and then we have a couple of thousand who would be in uh, fish processing, whether it's primary or secondary processing of fisheries pro fishery product, products. Sorry. Uh, so the, some of the main considerations that we would uh, have would be, you know, making sure uh, that harvesters in particular got fair prices and are, are not taken advantage of by uh, large uh, processing companies, many that are international in, in scope. So that'd be one of the main considerations we have in collective bargaining. A lot of our time is dealing with government agencies, particularly for us, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, uh, when it comes to policy and regulation. Uh, what we've developed in the last number of years has been an extensive 
in-house uh, science department. Um, like that's what I started off doing, coordinating science programs for our union. And in any given year, we have about 2,000 individual harvesters involved in, in organizing and collecting uh, science data for most of our main commercial uh, fisheries and some other things beyond directly in fishing. Uh, we still have around uh, 3,500 uh, individual fishing enterprises. So there's, I mean, these are 3,500 small businesses uh, that operate uh, all around our province, Newfoundland and Labrador, you know, be similar to other maritime and East Coast provinces as well. So we do have our harvesters fish a number of different species. And I think it's a, it's a good model where harvesters, people would fish uh, a variety of different species. You're not dependent on one species and, and hit that hard. Uh, people really think about, you know, the entire ecosystem. So they may fish some of the pelagic stocks like a herring, a mackerel, for example, and they understand how important that is for ground fish and the impacts on different fisheries on the bottom of species like crab or lobster that fish. So, I mean, it's good to be diversified uh, because like anything in uh, any economy, having all your investment in one species, uh, particularly as something as uh, volatile as the fishery, uh, I mean, you can really end up in difficult situations. So multi-species fisheries, we believe it's good for all of the right reasons, people respecting the ecosystem and then just the stability of, of your business, of course. And uh, last year, we got up to about a million uh, billion dollars, sorry, in, in landed value for our harvesters in our province. So most of that coming from this small boat inshore harvesters, we'd call, they go off to sea, we generally call them inshore, but they would have you know, anywhere from uh, three uh, people working on the vessel to, in some cases, uh, eight or nine, perhaps. So we did get a, just a couple of uh, comments, uh, you know, while we we're trying to prepare this. And, you know, hopefully uh, we'll have more time in the Q&A after, but we can, you know, I'll try to hit on some of the, the, the main points that people would really be concerned about. Uh, one of the things, despite us exporting a lot of our fish, is really focused on, uh, you know, ensuring having, uh, you know, local supply, food security for our, our people in a province is is one of our, our main concerns. And that's, you know, comes naturally with our history and certainly, uh, you know, people here, cod would be still a main thing in people's diet. You would eat uh, every every single week. It's ingrained uh, in our in our, our culture and history and everything else, but it still maintains most of the rural economy, despite despite the development of large oil and gas projects offshore and like other things like uh, mining and tourism. Uh, when you get outside the, the St. John's, where I I am today, I mean the, the fishing industry is still something something that, that carries the economy and ensuring that we have policies that say that people who are actually fishing, people who live next to the resource should be the people that benefit from that. And, uh, you know, we hear that whether it's inshore commercial harvesters and certainly we hear similar things from uh, many indigenous groups uh, as well. And I think it's, it's fair that people would, uh, would consider that some of the primary primary considerations here. So we continue to try to build uh, capacity, whether that's particularly in science these days, uh, more and more demands on our people to ensure that we're fishing sustainably and then doing all the work to prove that to the world, ensure that we have eco, uh, eco certifications and things like that. So uh, not only do we know we're fishing responsibly, but we can uh, can tell the world that we are as well. So that really leads me to, I think uh, one of the questions was, what do you think the, the, the biggest misconceptions about the fishery? It seems that so people who are, are fishing and those in the harvesting sector are, are overfishing uh, and, and really 
aggressively exploit uh, stocks. And mostly these are really the people who need the fishery to be the most sustainable. Uh, uh, you know, these are people who are living in communities dependent on the fishery, like they have a, a number of different species. And usually they're the first people to say that, you know, we I think we need to take it easy on this fishery, take a step back and we see things getting out of balance. So, I mean, we're not immune to some of the ecological disasters. Of course, if you studied the fishery, uh, Canadian fisheries, we all know about the cod moratorium of 1992, for example. And there's no doubt there was mistakes made and was overfished. But, uh, I, you know, I think most would see the history of that, that, uh, you know, governments made mistakes, uh, didn't listen to harvesters. And there was, you know, big environmental changes at the time. Uh, just for example, there are all of the ground fish species, whether it was cod or others that weren't actually commercially harvested at all, all of the populations generally crashed around the same time. So the environmental conditions at the same time were, were, were had a big role to play in what, what happened there. And uh, really a lot of the, the questions uh, kind of really still remain exactly what had happened and we're still, still some of the stocks are not where they were for sure back then, but a lot of it has to do with environmental conditions. And by the way, uh, I'm not monitoring the, the chat and the, the Q&A there, so uh, I hope that uh, you can deal with that in the end a little later. And I don't know the, the backgrounds of the, the audience as much here, but, you know, the east and west coast, uh, I'll admit I haven't spent a lot of time on the west coast, but I mean, you have a lot of colleagues, uh, you know, whether they're the fish harvesters from BC or part of the Canadian Independent Fish Harvesters Federation. So there are certainly more similarities between fishermen on the east coast and the west coast, and there are differences, but some of the main species are slightly different. You know, we see, you know, snow crab and lobster bin massive fisheries on the uh, on, on the east coast uh, now we see you know still more salmon focused on the west coast and some other things like uh, you know certainly gooey duck and oysters and uh, and things like that on the west coast but the biggest thing that we see is the dfo uh, management approach whereas on the west coast they mostly abandoned uh, you know independent inshore fish harvesters and coastal communities in British Columbia have really been, been decimated and hit hard because there was no priority placed on ensuring that local harvesters had access. Uh, a lot of the, 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 the value for uh, the fish that was in the ocean gravitated to, uh, to Vancouver and now beyond with more international companies getting access to the resource. So, Fish harvesters in BC are really fighting from behind to maintain, uh, you know, access to their fishing resources. Whereas it's struggle on the East Coast still with companies still trying to uh, get control of the fish in the ocean. We do have policies and now legislation that, that says that, uh, you know, legitimate inshore harvesters uh, got to be the owners and the beneficiaries of, of, the, of the fish generally. So there are some of the biggest differences that, that we would see. Uh, I would then, you know, the other question was about the, the, the media, how things are, are really portrayed. Um, you know, I, I think it's probably like all media more gravitate towards a, a bad news story and, uh, the good news is that over the last uh, number of years, the last eight years in a row, would we'll say, have been the most valuable years in the history of the Newfoundland and Labrador fishery. Uh, much the same for the rest of uh, Eastern Canada, at least. Uh, so speaks to fishing sustainably. We have uh, well-trained and we do, and we will provide really high value seafood like snow crab and uh, like lobster shrimp. So, I mean, it's a real success story. People are doing incredibly well. I would say a generation ago, 
and uh, let me say my father's generation more so. You know, fishery fishing uh, wasn't seen seen as something that people strive to be a part of. You know, it was okay. Uh, there was something that you, you a path was there was an option, but it wasn't really a profession that people saw as a way to go. But now uh, it's clear that this is something that has incredible value. People are proud and it's a lifestyle that people really like, I guess, the freedom and being outside. It's something that people uh, are, are drawn to. Uh, it's not easy. It's unpredictable. And with the success and value of it comes a lot of uh, quite difficult to, uh, you know, it's a, it's a big investment. It's hard to get into now, which is, kind of on the flip side before so you could get in there but you weren't making big wages and at the end of the year you uh, you, you may not have had a lot of a lot of money in the bank so as far as what people can do I mean I think you know this could be could have been a topic for an entire presentation you know how can we have people support our fisheries you know I think it's it's good I mean I'm glad that you know you guys are or talking to me today. I'm sure there's all kinds of people in this world you could be uh, could be having on here today. So I appreciate that. Uh, so exploring careers, and uh, there's a lot of different ways to contribute uh, to successful seafood uh, and fishery in this country. I think you know, looking at whether that's in 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 science or food production or in management or you know just uh, straight up fishing. And certainly, uh, you know, a lot of people look to to aquaculture as as a growing industry, and I know like that can be certainly polarizing in a lot of ways. But I think, uh, like a lot of other things, if done sustainably, it, uh, it it could be something that can provide a lot of food to the world, create employment, and if you do it responsibly, it, it doesn't have to be a bad thing. I know certainly there's, like I said, uh, other things, strong opinions on that. So I think learning more uh, about uh, our history, really, uh, you know, appreciating learning more about the seafood and where it comes from. And uh, one thing that I, I think at whatever level you're in, I find even those who are managing our fisheries now, many of the people who are in Ottawa, they're far removed from the people who were really impacted uh, by the fishery and who are living it. So, you know, listen to people who are, who are living it and got that lived experience in, in, in fishing and, and care about it. So I think that's, uh, that, that it's an important piece that often gets, gets missed. So we can read uh, academic papers and textbooks, but getting out and really finding ways to connect with people who are living that life, uh, I think can offer you a lot. So I think I probably mentioned uh, yeah, most of these. Um, you know, the world today is is certainly uh, much smaller than it was in the past. Our connection on social media, you know, you can connect with uh, with so many people so quickly that the previous generation couldn't have. So I mean, don't be shy to connect with people and seek out organizations that uh, that care about, you know, healthy oceans and the fisheries. And, uh, you know, I think there's lots of resources out there. Like I'd say, you know, check us out at the, at the FFAW as a, as a start. And we have certainly links and lots of, lots of people who are like-minded that we work with. Along the way, I should be describing some of the pictures there as well, but there we have a, Couple of crab harvesters. There's some uh, prime snow crab uh, that was harvested last year in Fortune Bay, in Newfoundland. If you can afford it, I'd suggest you go get a, get a get a feed of it for sure. And this uh, just talks about you know what, what's really I, I I think it's missing and in the discussion sometimes with federal federal regulators. I mean, the view of the fish that's off our coast that, 
you know, sustained communities for generations that, that people have really depended on and they look at it as, an, you know, an international commodity, you know. You know, if we could trade this here, if, you know, if uh, an international group or someone wants to come in and access this, it's, it seems like, you know, it, it's it's fair game. But I would argue that the fishery, bit of common property resource for Canadians, should focus on those coastal areas that depend on it and give, uh, you know, first consideration to people there to maintain the value of those resources in those areas. So uh, it's, you know, a big policy uh, battle. It's a big political issue across the country uh, because there are many, uh, particularly with money and strong lobbies that would like, uh, like nothing more than to have uh, smaller boat harvesters removed from the equation and, you know, basically have uh, have their way with the resources what right now are Canadians, but certainly privilege and priority given to inshore harvesters. So I, I think that is something I always remind people about, you know, basic fisheries policy in my position that I think is, is important to consider. So that is uh, the end of my presentation, at least. I ran through it, uh, I think, probably a couple of minutes quicker than we may have expected, but either the good news or the bad news, that leaves us more time for questions. So I'll stop there and, and pass it back to you.